fucking city. Okay. 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 So I'll take
Good evening, everyone. I'm Charles Royer, Director of the Institute of Politics, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our forum this evening. It's the first time, as far as I know, that the Institute has sponsored a forum event with the Harvard baseball team, and I hope it's not the last time that we do that. It's uh, also interesting that the uh, former commissioner of Major League Baseball be introduced tonight by a former mayor who fought with a series of baseball team owners on behalf of a city whose baseball team has been in existence the longest without winning a championship of any kind, <laughs> <clears throat> plays the game indoors, struggles for attendance, has the lowest TV earnings in all of the game, and just sold for $100 million, $23 million more than the previous owner paid for it just a couple of years earlier. So we both understand tonight from different and sometimes painful perspectives the economics and politics of modern American baseball. Faye Vincent joined Major League Baseball as Deputy Commissioner under Bart Giamatti in April of 1989, becoming Commissioner following Giamatti's untimely death just months later. Three years later in Chicago, baseball owners displeased with the Commissioner voted no confidence in him and asked him to resign. Newsweek magazine described Mr. Vincent as having, quote, reigned with a particularly strong arm and an independent mind. Invoking the unbridled powers of the commissioner, he ordered realignment of the divisions in the National League, divvied up the $190 million in the expansion pie in a way that dissatisfied both leagues, and opposed television superstation dominance of the game. That boldness, sometimes rash, sometimes wise, said Newsweek, infuriated owners used to tending their own fields. Stephen Jay Gould, who writes about baseball in essays that get printed in the uh, New York Review of Books, said he admired Vincent's ethics and his courage. Time Magazine said the more likely explanation for the owner's actions is that they are scared. After a decade, they saw revenues rise at least as quickly as labor costs, money getting tight, TV contracts expiring this year, getting less lucrative, and players' salaries averaging more than a million a year, which saw a 25% increase in 92, continuing to spiral, exacerbating the economics between big and smaller market teams and owners. Lots of problems for the leader of an enterprise whose other rules haven't changed much since it started. A former chairman of Columbia Pictures and a vice president of Coca-Cola, Faye Vincent, has served with the Securities and Exchange Commission and specialized in corporate banking and securities matters with the Washington law firm of Kaplan and Drysdale. No, not the pitcher. He's a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Williams College and Yale Law School. There have been 26 presidents of Harvard and only eight commissioners of baseball. We are especially honored tonight to have the eighth with us to speak on the subject, baseball and public policy. Faye Vincent. Thank you very much. That uh, statistic about commissioners and presidents reminds me of the line, I think it was Chesterton who said there are big lies, little lies, and then there are statistics. <laughs> Uh, I was at uh, New Haven uh, recently. I uh, was the Bob Kippeth fellow there for a few days. I enjoyed two days in New Haven. Yes, it can be done. I, uh, <laughs> I spoke last week at the Yale Club, but now, uh, I guess paraphrasing John Kennedy, I've, I've made the big leagues. I've, uh, I've finally come to Harvard for something serious. I did skip Princeton, but they're very big on science, and I had trouble with first-year chemistry. I had an exchange when I first came to baseball with a fellow. Uh, he said to me, um, where were you educated? And I said, uh, where are you from? He said he was from Massachusetts. I said, well, I got educated in Massachusetts. He said, oh, really? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, Harvard? I said, no, no not Harvard. He said, where? I said, Williams. He said, the college or TED? <laughs> I said, both. And I, I, I really meant it. Uh, my experience, of course, is that baseball is unique. I think baseball and humor are twins. Uh, think of a funny story about basketball. Um, baseball generates uh, great humor. And I think it's because baseball deals openly with 
human frailty. What other sport acknowledges error as part of the line score? We say hits, runs, and errors. Nobody else talks about mistakes. I had a, a Catholic priest one day uh, from South Boston come up to me at Fenway. He said, Commissioner, do you know why baseball is a Catholic sport? I said, no, Father, I really don't know that. And he said, it's because baseball deals with errors and redemption. <laughs> he had a point. Baseball is also noted for its simplicity, praise for its simplicity, but like everything else, that can be confusing to foreigners. There was an Englishman who came to the ballpark and he watched the game. He was taught uh, by his neighbor about the game at great length. The host kept asking him if he was understanding the game. He said yes. And finally, the host said to him, uh, how did he enjoy baseball? The Englishman looked at the board, which showed that the visitors had scored three runs in the first inning and that both teams had been scoreless since, and he said, oh, this is a fine game, dear boy. He said, the Bostons are ahead 30 million to nothing. <laughs> but we can all be confused by baseball. I will tell you a story that I think you'll probably repeat. It is one of my favorite baseball stories, and it involves an American League umpire named Derwood Merrill. Uh, I, I'm going to get serious, but, you know, not for a long while. Uh, <laughs> Derwood Merrill once said to me, Commissioner, he's an old boy from West Texas, and he said, you know, Commissioner, he said, they tell me this Nolan Ryan's terrific these days, but he said, Commissioner, he said, you should have been there in 1976. He said, I'm a rookie umpire. Now, Commissioner, he said, I'm really scared. I'm going to have the plate one night in California, and Nolan Ryan is the pitcher. And he said, I'm really nervous. Now, he said, I go out before the game, and he said, oh, Nolan's warming up, and he said, I hear this hum, the ball comes in. I hear this big pop when the ball hits the uh, mitt. And he said, man, it was a loud pop. Now he said the game starts. And he said, I go out there, old Mickey Rivers is up. Andy Echeverin's the catcher. And he said, the first pitch, I hear that same hum. And then I hear that big pop. And I say, strike one. And everybody yells. And he said, I'm having a great time. Now he said, here comes the second pitch. He said, I hear the hum. He said, I hear that big pop. He said, Commissioner, I didn't see the pitch. He said, I couldn't see it. Now he said, what do I do? I never saw it. He said, the ball came, there was a pop. I didn't see it. Now he said, oh, Echeverin, he waits. And he said, nothing happens. I don't do anything. <laughs> Echeverin says, umpire, call the pitch. He said, I don't know what to do. Commissioner, I'm a rookie. What do you do? I never saw it. He said, now Echeverin yells, umpire, goddammit, call the pitch. He said, I said, oh, well, it's Steve Reich, too. He said, at that point, old Rivers backs out. And he says, oh, don't worry, I didn't see it either. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll tell that. I told Derwood that I tell it so often that if he ever travels around after me, his story's dead. <laughs> you know, during the winter, and we're about to start, all we read about is contract problems, ownership battles, difficulties in baseball. Let me give you a quote. Baseball has changed. This is from a player. Now all the players care about is money. In the old days, we loved the game. We loved to play. But today, no one cares about the game. All the talk is of money. It's sad. It's a very interesting quote. It was made in 1868. I tell you, very little in baseball is new. The business of baseball really hasn't changed. Baseball is still filled with confrontation like those in the paper. But in fact, all of the present problems in baseball have distinct parallels in history. An example, when Judge Landis died, the first commissioner, the owners decided they'd had enough of a strong commissioner and they changed the authority of the commissioner and they took away the best interest clause, which gives the commissioner enormous power. Landis had used it, and I think the owners felt they'd seen quite enough of that. Happy Chandler and Ford Frick, his two successors, did not have that authority. And I think Frick eloquently expressed his dissatisfaction when he retired. He complained about not having the authority and spoke about it in his valedictory. And the owners, in fairness, returned that authority to subsequent uh, commissioners. So there is present precedent 
even for the present vacillations in baseball and the commissioner. I say to you, uh, be of good cheer. This, too, will certainly pass. And yet, beneath the surface of baseball, there are some public policy issues, and I thought I would address just three of them uh, reasonably briefly. I promise you that interstitially, I will lard this with baseball stories, so it won't all be, uh, it won't all be uh, uh, public policy. The three issues are, one, the continued debate over the present antitrust exemption that baseball enjoys and that Congress is reexamining. Two, the so-called superstation issue. That involves the complicated legislation that gives superstations the right to a compulsory license of programming to carry baseball across the country without the consent of baseball or the copyright owner. And three, the generic debate that always goes on as to whether baseball has any special public obligations, whether it is in fact a public trust. I would imagine that after listening to those topics, even in front of so distinguished an audience, you might say these are simple questions and there are simple answers. But in baseball, everything is subject to challenge. And I will cite you the scientific confrontation between one of baseball's resident geniuses, the great Leo the Lip DeRocher, and a writer who had done some studying and who had written an article saying that the curveball was an optical illusion. <laughs> on the field one day, Leo was listening to this writer go on at length about the curveball and his article and how, as a matter of scientific proof, curveball made no sense and was in reality an illusion. DeRocher took it for as long as he could, and then he said to the writer, can I ask you uh, to do something? And the writer said, uh, yes. He said, well, here's what, what I'd like you to do. He said, would you go up to the plate? And he said, we'll put a door in front of the plate, a big wooden door. And you stand up there with a bat and the door between you and the pitcher. And the writer, obviously puzzled, said, and what will happen? And Leo said, my guy will stand out there 60 feet away and he'll beat your head soft with that optical illusion. <laughs> <clears throat> the issues, they do contain some overlapping considerations. The history of the antitrust exemption, of course, has its origin in Harvard because Mr. Justice Holmes, who was born, raised, and educated not far from here, wrote the opinion in 1922 holding that baseball believe it or not, was not a business within the meaning of the federal statute on antitrust. It was not a business to be subject to antitrust regulation. That ruling has stood basically unchanged for over 70 years. Congress could change it at any time, but has not. The immunity gets litigated and it gets tinkered with, but it has not basically been uh, withdrawn. Indeed, my predecessor, my great friend Bart Giamatti one time, was in uh, Washington. You know, Bart had a responsible position at a lesser school a little south of here, but <laughs> he went on to better things. And uh, he was in Washington. They were harassing him. The senators were about baseball's immunity. And he said to them, now, gentlemen, let me ask you a question. You can only take this immunity away once. After you've done it, what will you do next? And I think Bart made a point. I suspect Congress may prefer the issue to the solution. Without the threat, baseball might even be emboldened. My views are reasonably simple. I testified last year before the Senate Judiciary Committee that baseball should retain the immunity if baseball deserves it. That is, there is a special privilege for baseball and it should be warranted and earned by performance. If baseball continues to accept that it is in fact subject to trust, to public policy trust, deserving of special considerations by Congress, then I think the immunity should stand. But if, as may be the case, club owners take the view that there's no public duty, that they are free, as every other business, to do what they choose in the governance of baseball, then I think Congress should say baseball should be treated like all other businesses and the immunity withdrawn. In fact, the immunity is important. It's not vital. Baseball would go along quite happily without it. And to some extent, I think the owners are convinced that even if baseball loses the immunity, their business will not be severely limited. 
it will affect the minor league draft, it will affect uh, some minor league operations, it will certainly affect the way baseball meets and discusses some subjects, but it will not be a major uh, problem for baseball. My guess, for what it's worth, is that Congress is serious about taking that exemption away. I think those in Congress believe that there should be an independent, powerful commissioner, and that without such a commissioner, there is every reason to withdraw the immunity. I think it would be sad to have the immunity go, not because I'm sentimental, but because I think baseball over 70 years has demonstrated that it handled that immunity pretty well. I don't think there's a single case you can point to where baseball abused the immunity. Somebody will say collusion. But collusion wasn't done because of the immunity. It was a bad thing. It was scandalous. But it really had nothing to do uh, with the immunity. So again, my conclusion, the immunity should stay only if baseball deserves it. And if, as the New York Times wrote of me, that that makes me the last of the romantics, uh, so be it. Uh, for someone with my background and tradition to be called a romantic is um, something of an uh, anomaly, and I wonder about it. The second issue is uh, superstations. Some of you understand this issue. I used to say to owners, I could give a quiz on what the superstation issue is to all of the owners in baseball, and only two of the 28 would pass. Um, and that's not being uh, critical of ownership. It is a very complicated, almost astonishing uh, situation. Let me tell you what it involves and see if I can do it uh, very briefly. But before, before I do it, I'll tell you one of my favorite uh, baseball stories. I think you'll also uh, repeat this one. It deals with uh, Casey Stengel. Now, you remember uh, Casey. He even worked up here in Boston for a while. He, managed the Boston Braves when they were a disastrous team in the 40s. And uh, while he was here, he had on his staff a young rookie pitcher named Warren Spahn. Now, Spahn went on to become the winningest left-hander in the history of baseball. And Casey didn't do badly. He won 10 pennants in 12 years with the Yankees. Spahn had a great line. He came back to be with Stengel when Stengel was with the Mets in the 60s. And he said to a reporter one day, you know, he said, I pitched for Casey before and after he was a genius. <laughs> Baseball has some very good philosophy. The moment involving Stengel uh, is in Brooklyn. Uh, he's managing the Dodgers, and on this day, he takes the Dodgers to Philadelphia. Before the Phillies were where they presently are in the vet, there was a stadium called the Baker Bowl long before your time and mine. But the Baker Bowl is not what people talk about when they get nostalgic about old ballparks. It was tiny. The outfield wall was covered with tin and advertising. It was a real bandbox. And playing right field for Brooklyn on this very day was the legendary Hack Wilson, a terrific hitter, a liability in right field, and the possessor of a prodigious thirst. And on this particular day, Hack had indulged the thirst the evening before, and he was suffering from a monstrous hangover in right field. <laughs> Stengel goes out to the mound. The pitcher for the Dodgers that day was aptly named Boom Boom Beck. Can you imagine a pitcher <laughs> being named Boom Boom? Boom Boom was getting boomed, and <laughs> Stengel goes out to take him out. And Boom Boom decides to engage Casey in debate. And he's stalking around the mound. Casey's having trouble confronting Boom Boom, uh, the umpire has not arrived. And out in right field, Hack is uh, bored. And he goes over, feeling this hangover, and leans up against the right field fence. I've told you it's hot. The fence is tin. In no time, Hack is sound asleep. <laughs> on the mound, the drama goes on. At one point, Beck, furious at Stengel, wheels around, takes the ball, and whistles it out to right field, where it hits the tin wall, makes a resounding sound. Our friend Hack leaps to his feet, jumps on the ball, and fires a perfect strike <laughs> to second base. <laughs> now the pitching change is over. Casey comes back to the bench, and he says to the guys, look, he said, when he comes in, don't nobody say anything. It's the best play he's made in two weeks. <laughs> the superstation. I have to do this. 
We could tell stories all night, but this is Harvard. <laughs> Williams, I go to Williams, we just tell stories, but <laughs> Harvard, we're going to talk about the compulsory license. <laughs> in the 70s, Congress in its wisdom said, we got to help cable. Now, you saw what cable has done. There's a cable deal in the paper that involves $35 billion. But in the 70s, Congress gave cable owners and operators a terrific blessing. And it passed a law saying that a television station could take its programming, basically, without the permission of the owner of the copyright. You could put that signal up on the satellite through a common carrier, and it would be available to cable stations all over the country. Now, what that meant was Ted Turner, who was a genius, figured out quickly that he'd put the Braves games up on the satellite. He'd sell those rights all over the country to cable station operators, and he would build what is, in fact, a superstation. The cable companies pay through a formula to something in Washington called the Copyright Tribunal. None of you knew it existed. It's a tribunal of federal officers, bureaucrats, whose sole job is to allocate this money to copyright owners, one of which is baseball. Nobody knows this entire process is taking place, including people in Congress. The result is that baseball owners and baseball have games on television to which they have not given consent. The games are carried across the country. The money comes in. The, there is no marketplace transaction. There's no negotiation between baseball and the television operators over what the price would be for that programming. And it didn't take a genius to recognize that the superstations were making baseball's television much less valuable. It hurts television uh, cable programming like ESPN. And it surely hurts the national, uh, what used to be the CBS package. And so I decided, uh, not without support, that I would try to get that compulsory license eliminated. The other commissioners had less interest because football doesn't have the problem. Uh, there's only national television for football. Basketball has uh, some of the problem and joined with us. And I went after the compulsory license in a big way. Uh, that did not endear me to either of the major owners of Superstations, uh, the Tribune Company in Chicago or Turner in Atlanta. And needless to say, uh, the issue of realignment, though it, it really looked to the world as if it was my issue with some of the owners. In fact, the Superstation issue was really uh, the issue. Indeed, the cry for revenue sharing that you're hearing now is a function of baseball having been defeated by the Superstations. And the fact that there's no cable television in Milwaukee and in Seattle and in other markets is surely a function of the existence of the superstation. I think the public policy issue is clear. Why should there be a subsidy to cable owners uh, at this day and age? Why shouldn't there be a marketplace transaction? I'm not talking necessarily about taking the games off the air. All I want is for baseball to get paid a fair open market price for the programming. If there's going to be a subsidy, why should it go to an industry, the largest company of which is now being purchased for $35 billion? The superstations are driven by baseball. Without baseball, there'd be no superstation. Who wants to pay money to see reruns of the Beverly Hillbillies? <laughs> the only thing you want, and the thing that gets baseball, I mean, that gets the superstations bought, is in fact baseball. Live, current, non-duplicatable, not available elsewhere baseball. So I once went, I met with Ted Turner, who's a friend and actually an interesting guy. And I said, Ted, what do you make? How much do you get from the superstation at the Brave? Oh, Commissioner, he said, you, 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 we get almost nothing, Commissioner. <laughs> I mean, it's nothing. I've dealt with Ted over years in the movie business. And so I said, yeah, Ted, well, I, uh, what's the number? <laughs> so he said, uh, I'll give you a number, not there. I see, he said, uh, well, a number? I said, yeah, a number, Ted, you know, one to a big number. What is it? <laughs> he said, it's seven million, Commissioner. I said, really? I said, so for seven million, that's what you get from the superstation on baseball. And yeah. I said, well, what if we paid you 14? I said, think of it, Ted. You doubled your money. You're a terrific hero to the people who own the company. Only one thing, keep the games off the air. You got all the money, and uh, all we want is for you not to carry the games. He said, Commissioner, I can't make that deal. I said, I know, Ted. 
I know why you can't make the deal. The superstation's worth probably 100 million plus to Turner and the same to uh, WGN. It's a very big um, business. Now, you know, when I sit here and I'm critical of, of baseball, there's always the risk that someone says, well, uh, it's sour grapes and you're annoyed. Uh, I, I, I try not. I think I will cite you a quote that uh, sums up my position on current issues. And later, when you ask me to talk about current issues, I will invoke this quote. It's from uh, Stanley Baldwin, the uh, British Prime Minister. I spent most of the year in England. And uh, Baldwin once said, when you are no longer captain of the ship, you should never spit on the deck or give orders to the helmsman. That is very good advice. And so if you ask me a question that I don't want to answer, I will give you the answer, Baldwin. <laughs> How about Ted Williams? Ted Williams is a remarkable uh, fellow, a, a dear friend. And I think Ted really had an insight in uh, 1941. Remember, that was the year at the end of the season he was hitting uh, slightly over uh, 400. He was uh, then, you know, for him, had a little slump, and he slid to 3995, which if you round it off would have been 400. He comes to the last game of the season, and uh, in fact, a doubleheader. No one had hit 400 in many years, 52 years, in fact. And uh, so he was interested in batting uh, 400. But uh, at the last of the season with a doubleheader, Joe Cronin went to him and said, you know, Ted, you really don't have to hit. Uh, why don't you stay on the bench? You'll have the 400, and that'll be it. Williams, of course, went out and played. He insisted on playing. And he finished the year hitting 406. He had a great day. And Lefty Gomez said years later, you know, thinking about Ted in 400, hitting 400 was a sign of Ted's great talent. Playing that last day was a sign of his class. And I think that's right. I think Ted knew, despite all his problems with fans and columnists here and Colonel Egan, that he owed it to the fans. He would have been criticized, and he knew it. And so he went out and played. I think Ted owes something to the fans, and I think baseball owes something to the fans. And that's issue three. A few weeks ago, Ira Burkow, my columnist there in New York, wrote that baseball was like all other business. He disputed the claim that baseball uh, should have some different obligations. And maybe he's right. I, I don't think so. I think baseball takes so much from public support. And I'm not just talking about stadia and uh, local support, but from uh, Congress. Obviously, baseball benefits from the antitrust immunity, but think of it. Luxury boxes are deductible. You can depreciate players as assets. There is a tax-exempt status for central baseball. Baseball is vulnerable to Congress, and if Congress wants to twist the knife, it has many ways in which to do so. So I, I submit to you that baseball depends on fans. I think the fans own baseball, in fact, and that there is a proper duty toward those fans. I think it is important uh, baseball to our culture. It is ingrained in our lives because it, it's the happy game of the summer. It's the only game played outdoors all summer in most places. It's the only significant game without a clock. You and I know all of the rhapsodic reasons to uh, love baseball. It is, in fact, also a monopoly. And Congress, I think, has every reason to want to be sure that baseball is run properly and doesn't overreach. And I think a commissioner helps by serving as that uh, nexus between the game and public authorities. As I say, I don't think baseball has done a bad job of observing that uh, obligation, but things may change. Much is changing. One owner said to me, you know, Faye, I don't like commissioners. I don't like you. I don't like David Stern. We don't want a commissioner. We want to own the game. We think we should make the decisions. We don't need anybody like you running around invoking public authority. We want the commissioner to speak for us the way the union leader speaks for the players. He should be our CEO. He should report to us, and he should do just what we want. And they may go that route. That's a powerful owner. If they do, I think that would be regrettable. But you in this hallowed academic hall ought to resist. After all, the role of a great university like this is to permit study 
and comment on tough issues, provide a forum for retired bureaucrats like me to come back, issue comments, you can do something. The future of the game is really a function of your attention and your involvement. Take the issues on, why not? Dean Acheson had the great line, when in doubt, do the right thing. <laughs> I don't believe a commissioner is a figurehead. If I were a figurehead, why were they so eager to get rid of me? Let me end this little discourse by telling you a story about a superstar, not a superstar, a regular guy, a guy who wasn't a superstar. You remember him, perhaps. Rocky Bridges, remember with the big uh, chaw of tobacco? <clears throat> And uh, late in his career, he goes to the Reds. They have this wonderful second play combination of, of uh, Johnny Temple and Roy McMillan, way before the time of these uh, young men. But they were wonderful ball players. And of course, Bridges didn't get in very much. One day, Temple gets hurt. He's playing second base. They're playing the Dodgers. The Dodgers had that great team. And Bridges says, uh, you know, he said, I'm out at second base. Ferrello gets a hit. I'm sorry, Hodges gets a hit. He's on first base. He's 6'2", he weighs 220, big tough guy. Ferrillo's up. And he said, Ferrillo hits a ground ball in the hole at short. McMillan goes over there and he said, I hear Hodges coming down the line. Ka-thump, ka-thump. 6'2", 220, ka-thump, ka-thump. I'm over at second base. McMillan, all-star, can't get the ball out of his glove. Here comes, here comes Hodges, ka-thump, ka-thump. Now, he said, he sounds like the 415 pulling into the station, and he said, I yell over at McMillan, hey, All-Star, if you get the ball, go to first. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> he said, I get the hell out. The 415 comes in right on schedule. <laughs> and he said, I was gone. So that's what I'm going to do. I hear the 415, and I'm getting out of here. Thank you very much. Well, as is our custom, we uh, will do the Q&A. Let's make the Q's shorter than the A's, and uh, let's go to these four microphones, two on the floor and two in the first uh, balcony. Just remember and, Stanley Baldwin. <laughs> yes. And uh, just briefly identify yourselves and, uh, and ask a question. Uh, Anthony Flint from the Boston Globe. There's a rumor that uh, George Mitchell is interested in the commissioner's job. I wondered if you had heard anything along those lines and uh, what kind of commissioner you think he'd be. You know, that's a perfectly appropriate question, which I'm not going to answer, but the, uh, <laughs> the, the, answer is the, the answer a CIA person gives when you ask him if he was at a meeting, he will say to you, if indeed there was such a meeting, I can't talk about it. <laughs> so I will tell you, if indeed there is such a rumor, I have no comment. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Yushan Zaidi. I'm a member of the Student Advisory Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Welcome on our Thank behalf. Uh, please don't say Baldwin. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. We all remember that when Roger Maris hit 50, uh, 61 home runs, the, the commissioner at the time, I believe it was Ford Frick, put an asterisk um, in the record book saying, you know, Maris did it in 162 games, Ruth only had 154. Um, what do you feel about that? If you had been commissioner at the time, would you have done it? And while you were commissioner, did you have the power to change that? And if you did, why didn't you? <laughs> the answer is I did and I did. I did have the power and I changed it. And it, there's no longer an asterisk. Very nice question. And uh, if you have any more like that. Yes, the fact is. <laughs> Well, I didn't know about that. Congratulations. <laughs> you sound like some of the owners. Do we have one up here? Yeah. Uh, Dan Edmonds, Sharon Mass. I'd like to know what your opinion is of the designated hitter rule and how it could be possible to get rid of it. <laughs> For those of us who want to see more strategy in the game. You know, Bart had a wonderful line about the designated hitter. It is the most asked question of uh, baseball bureaucrats. Um, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a good question. But when Bart was asked, he would often say, the designated hitter is the finest occasion for non-consequential debate during the off season. 
I think the designated hitter is an atrocity and should be eliminated and probably will be eliminated. But you have to bear in mind as you look at baseball and some of the things that are presently being done, when you make a change, as the designated hitter was done in the 70s, as an experiment, it is very hard to get rid of it. It was done to improve offense in the American League, to get people in the ballpark. It was thought the American League wasn't drawing as well because there weren't as many home runs. It was a very bad idea. It's, a, it's an experiment that should have been declared a great success and uh, doomed years ago. It takes a vote of ownership, unfortunately. And uh, it also takes negotiation with the players' union, who are very supportive of the designated hitter because it gives older senior ball players who make a lot of money employment. So it will not be easy to get away, get rid of, but it should be done. Yes, sir. You. Hi, um, I'm Brian Schwartz. I attend the Harvard Business School. As a lifelong <laughs> resident of St. Petersburg, Florida, I'm curious of sort of your personal opinion, how it made you feel um, when so many people can get disappointed so often and whether there's some personal um, reflections you have on that. Well, I think uh, when you think about communities for baseball, you have to think about two things. One, the community, which includes the ballpark and the demographics, but equally important, ownership. <laughs> that is, the people who are going to put up the money and run the team. So if a community fails to get a franchise, it may be the former, but it may also be the latter. In the case of St. Petersburg, without telling you which it was, the people in St. Petersburg believe that it was the former. It may very well have not been the former. And there may be an occasion through expansion or transfer when a team will end up in St. Petersburg. It's a perfectly fine community. There aren't many around that qualify for baseball. And so I, I would think a team will end up in St. Petersburg in the not too distant future. But in the last go around, since I was involved, I will tell you that the correct was, decision was made. St. Petersburg was not, for one of those two reasons, um, a powerful candidate. Sir. Hi, Faye. My name is Mike St. Clemente. I write for Baseball Underground. I know that you're a purist. I'm wondering what your views are on expansion. Obviously, it brings a lot of money into the game and allows more fans to view the game. But obviously, it does a lot to the quality of the game. Do you feel that further expansion is beneficial? And do you feel the expansion that's already occurred has been a good move? Well, when I was in college, there were 16 teams. And now there are 28. Um, expansion is inevitable. There'll be more. I, I have doubts about it. Um, because I don't think it is financially as successful for baseball as people think. On the other hand, uh, if I lived in Colorado and in areas that didn't have baseball and I hadn't a chance to take um, children to baseball games, I would feel uh, very deprived. So I think there's terrific political pressure from areas of the country that don't have baseball to gain baseball. I think that pressure will continue. Uh, and, and I think uh, from what I read in baseball, there is again some thinking about expansion because ownership believes that um, expansion is financially attractive. The fact is, it's not. And you dilute the equity of the present team substantially. But uh, given the attitude, I suspect there will be expansion. And uh, there'll probably be two leagues of 20 teams before not very long. Sir. Uh, Craig Lambert, Harvard Magazine. Um, the pennant race, cer certainly one of the great thrills and spectacles in American sport. And luckily this year we had a really superb one that went down to the last day. Um, but it looks like this season is going to be the last one in which there really is a genuine pennant race in, in Major League Baseball, since the owners have decided uh, in their wisdom that uh, to add another echelon of playoffs uh, and uh, create another product for television rights uh, to, to be sold again. Um, it seem, does it, it seem as if the fans' pockets being picked here of, of one of the great thrills in sports and with no accountability. I mean, the, the fans don't get a, a vote here at all. Um, have you got any comment on this? Or is there any, you know, what, what happened to, to the fan in the street uh, in this, this kind of a situation? Yeah, well, that, that's a mainline Stanley Baldwin question. Uh, absolutely mainline. I will say to you, the only 
consolation I offer to you as a historian is to look at the remarkable phenomenon of two all-star games. Do you remember? And no. if Well, there was a time when, in their wisdom, uh, baseball owners decided there ought to be two all-star games for reasons that should be clear. Um, and I, I guess my only comment, as I ignore Stanley Baldwin a bit, is to say that uh, if you're an optimist, you will reflect on the short-lived existence of the two all-star game phenomenon. I'm biting my tongue. Uh, yes, sir. My name is uh, John Turley, and I'm a minor league baseball player who, fortunately, I had the privilege of playing for Rocky Bridges uh, this year. Um, does he I still have the chaw? Uh, he does. And in fact, I saw him get kicked out of eight straight games <laughs> because he, he defies the law. Um, I, would, I wondered how you feel about the tobacco ban policy in the minor leagues only, and especially with such legends like Rocky Bridges, who defy it no matter, you know, despite the warnings and get kicked out of the game. Well, I, I put the ban in, so it's hard for me to... Uh... <laughs> Uh, I, I happen to think that uh, chewing tobacco is uh, dangerous. And more importantly, it sets such a ferocious example when uh, our good friend Dykstra uh, goes through what he goes through. Uh, and you know, he, he, he really ought to be cited for environmental <laughs> violations because center field, I, you, you don't have the luxury, but I used to have to walk across the ballpark afterwards to get out. And, uh, you know, it's pretty well festooned out there. <laughs> the answer is, I think, uh, in the minor leagues, before people have developed the habit of playing baseball and chewing, we ought to try to keep them from doing it. Uh, Rocky Bridges is um, incorrigible, we know that, as is Bruce Fremming, the umpire who chews, and a bunch of other guys whom I love. But nevertheless, um, I think to give kids the example that you have to chew to play baseball or that you can't play baseball without chewing is just not appropriate. And, and if I could have done it, I would have banned it just across the board. But I couldn't, so I did what I could. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not defensive about it. I think it was the right thing. And uh, I think probably it will get extended. I know they did extend it a bit this year. Uh, up into the minors, and uh, I think it has a life of its own. I hope Rocky forgives me because he is a terrific guy. But, uh. Sir. Uh, my name is Keller Norris. I'm a senior at the college. Over the past year, the po San Diego Potters have been virtually dismantled. As a commissioner, would you have and could you have put a stop to this? Well, I, I, depending on which court you listen to, uh, a commissioner in the old days probably had some authority in that area. The difficulty with that situation, from my point of view, is I just don't know enough about it. You, you, I know what I read, but I, 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 the, all I can say is that I think any commission, and certainly I, would have looked at it. Whether the facts would have warranted intervention, I just don't know because I haven't, I really haven't looked at it, and I don't know what uh, Tommy Werner's argument would be. Finley made it easy. I mean, uh, for Bowie, uh, Finley made everything easy. He just did it in such a flagrant way. He announced what he was going to do, why. I mean, he gave the whole thing away. Uh, people are a little more subtle these days, and it takes a little more uh, intervention. But yes, I would have looked into it. My name is Kerry Green. I'm a student at the Harvard Business School. My original question related to the Padres as well, but sort of an extension of that is your views on revenue sharing. It seems that the Padres are probably not the last team to have to go through a fire sale. The Pirates sort of did the same thing in the last few years. So I'd like to hear what you, what you have to say on that topic. Well, I think baseball really has to come to a broad universal agreement among owners and the Players Association to put the financial molecule in some sense of stability. Uh, it can't go on like this uh, indefinitely. There has to be some arrangement. Um, the players are doing so well and their union is so powerful and the owners historically have been so inept that <laughs> baseball goes on this way. Um, Remember, basketball made its major transformation because basketball was in trouble, and the Players Association recognized that. Football had a federal judge telling them if they didn't come to free agency, he would take care of it for them. 
And <laughs> absent that kind of external <laughs> pressure, and baseball doesn't have that external pressure, it's pretty tough. The union argues that the owners are doing fine. Yeah, they may lose money, but everyone who sells makes a profit. And anyway, why should we care? If some of them lose money, that's not our problem. That's their problem. Get some richer owners. Players move toward the uh, upper scale, higher paying teams, but that's the marketplace. That's what happens with television announcers who migrate to Los Angeles and New York. It's the good old American system. The, the player's argument has considerable force. Uh, it's a free market uh, argument, and we are basically a free market economy. But baseball has to do something economically to uh, put its house in order. And uh, I think, regrettably, this latest fiasco in baseball means that uh, that day is just postponed uh, for, for a good time. Yes. My name is Lisa Heinz, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question goes to one of the things that we study here at the school, and that is management and your management and leadership. It strikes me that you were faced with a pretty uh, unenviable situation when you started your job as commissioner in terms of the person whom you were following, a friend and someone of substantial stature, charisma maybe, uh, tragedy perhaps. And I wondered if you could share with us anything that was going through your mind when you knew that you were going to be taking on that new role as commissioner and what that challenge felt like to you? Well, um, you're correct. It was, uh, it was difficult both because BART was uh, in some sense larger than life and because we were dear friends. I mean, he was like a brother and uh, we were on a wonderful little run, he and I. We'd always wanted to be together. He finished with Yale and I'd finished with Columbia and Coca-Cola. The idea was whichever one of us could hire the other first would do it. And uh, so he got the baseball and I went with him. And we had just a lyrical five months, except for Pete Rose. I mean, we spent the whole time fighting with Pete. And I mean, to be with Bart while he was sued was a remarkable experience. Uh, he did not understand uh, the law. He had no s sort of sympathy for lawyers, not much for Pete either, but the process. <laughs> <laughs> the process drove him crazy. And I used to say to him, Bart, I know this judge in Cincinnati ruled against you. We have, remember that little judge out there who ruled against Bart? And I kept saying, but he, w the system works. It works. And Bart would come into a room and he'd say, there he is, Bay Vincent. He believes in the system. I said, can you imagine anybody believing in the system? He tells me the system works. Can you understand it? Bart was wonderful. I think management, uh, I knew what I was getting into. I think Bart knew. Uh, neither of us was, had any illusions about baseball owners. We also read history. We knew that there'd never been a commissioner who survived. Uh, it's like being the mayor of the city of New York. You know, there's, there's, there's no, no hope. Um, <laughs> well, we loved the game and we, we were going to have a good time. And I think e each of us was reasonably independent, if not stubborn. I. Uh, I thought I would do the best I could, that uh, whatever happened, I would survive. And uh, I think that's really what Bart's attitude would have been. I think it would have been a mistake to say, no, I don't want a job. I, I, you know, I, that wouldn't have been appropriate. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad it's over. But uh, I miss Bart. He, someday, I, I've got to write and uh, try to capture Bart. He was, uh, he, he was different. And I think the public perception of him would be even better if they knew more about him. Yes. Yes. He also would never put Pete Rose back in baseball, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yes, my name's Adam Beatty. I am also made the trek over across the river from the business school. Uh, my question is, baseball has lost ground both from an, from an economic standpoint and also from a fan support standpoint to both the National Football League and the National Basketball Association lately. And I was wondering, in your opinion, what steps, if any, can be taken to reverse this trend? Well, um, baseball has its problems. I, I don't think some of what you said is totally accurate. Do you know, and not many people do, that the highest rated basketball game on television has never come to the level of a baseball game during the World Series. The seventh game of the basketball series is still, as a tel television phenomenon, significantly less watched than the World Series games. 
basketball has done remarkably well in attracting terrific young athletes. Part of that is the, the phenomenon of baseball is it takes more people, it takes space, it's dangerous, you can get hurt playing baseball, it's difficult. Um, you, you, standing up there and having somebody throw a ball at your head um, when you're a young kid, and you and I know we all did it, uh, takes some guts. Uh, basketball, I think, is a game all of us could get reasonably good at by practicing. If you shoot enough foul shots, you will get pretty good at it. You can stay there all night long working at hitting, and you may never get a loud foul. Uh, it's a difficult game. I think what baseball's failed to do and what I tried to do in, in my short tenure was get baseball back working with the kids to get uh, baseball, uh, even younger than little league age, uh, played, get more leagues going with rookie ball, work with minorities in the cities, work with uh, foundations in various areas to, to build baseball. But none of that's going to happen overnight. And again, I think with baseball's turmoil and all the changes in leadership, those issues get sublimated very quickly to revenue sharing and labor problems. In fact, those are the issues. Um, baseball's got to do a much better job of building its support among younger people, get kids playing the game earlier, get them to enjoy it and love it the way uh, we loved it. But you ought not to develop any thesis that baseball's in serious trouble. The attendance this year was remarkable. People love baseball in what, I mean, this tonight tells you it. it baseball has a grab on the American soul that is uh, very hard to duplicate. And uh, there are lots of evidences. I mean, think of a great book written about football or basketball. I mean, li the literature of the sports tells you something about it. Think of a great writer who spends his time writing as Roger Angel did or John Updike. They're not writing about basketball. John Updike doesn't write about football. Baseball has a special uh, cachet and uh, it has its problems, but it will be here a long, long time. You just answered most of my question, but I, I wanted to address the the, the playoff uh, system that, that it will be going into play in 94 with the, the three-tier approach and the television package and, and the argument that it will attract more kids or all-night games televised will, will detract from, from children being able to watch the game. And I, I want to know what your spin on, on the, the TV package and, and, the, and the night game play is for, for young, the younger generation to get involved. Well, I, again, I, th I think in fairness to baseball, I, I just don't think it's appropriate for me to take that issue on. It's current. Those people have wrestled with it. They have studied it. I haven't. Uh, you know, I have my suspicions, as I said earlier. But I, I really think that Peter Ubroff, who was one of my predecessors, did a great thing. After he left baseball, he basically didn't talk about current issues. He, I never picked up the paper and had Peter lecturing me about something current in baseball. He might say something supportive, but if he disagreed, he kept his mouth shut. And I think there's a certain nobility in that. And it's tempting to sort of be facetious and use the Stanley Baldwin quote, but there's something I think sound uh, and even wise uh, about staying out of those issues. And I, I don't mean to be rude to you, but I just don't want to talk about things I don't know that much about. Sir. Hi, my name is Matt Anestis, and I'm a junior here at the college and a member of the Institute of Politics. Um, I'm trying to avoid a Baldwin here, so I'm asking you this next question uh, in a non-official, uh, purely technical, non-ex-commissioner, uh, fan of the game way. Off the record with 20 reporters here. <laughs> Who do you think is going to win the World Series? Yeah. You know, Toronto, uh, if you look at that team and you look at those first six ball players, you think you're watching the All-Star game. Uh, how anybody can beat Toronto is beyond me. I mean, you, you have to say on any given seven game or any season, anything, Toronto has to win. On the other hand, the wonderful thing about baseball is that the Torontos of the world often lose. I mean, I was around that World Series between Cincinnati and Oakland when Oakland looked like the Colossus of the West and Cincinnati swept them. I tell you, there wasn't a soul even at Harvard, who predicted. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's what makes baseball wonderful. You don't need much. You need two guys to win two games and uh, a little luck and a bad bounce or something. So I, 
uh, on paper, I'm with everybody else in the country who says, of course, Toronto's going to win. But way down deep, I think Philadelphia's going to win. <laughs> The, the follow-up question could be, Boston won the first World Series. When are they going to? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Jim Saylor. I'm a Kennedy School student. I'm also a lifelong Cincinnati Reds fan. And there were some people who knew the best team in 1990, so don't worry about that. You, my, you predicted a sweep, did you? I, I didn't say sweep. Five <laughs> games, no problem. Uh, uh, my question goes to, it, it actually relates to that in that uh, when I uh, uh, grew up with the Reds, it was during the 1970s, and uh, we had a, a great team during most of those years, but one of the things that, that I loved about that team was the fact that it was a team throughout most of the decade. There were people that came and left, uh, of course, but the nucleus of the team and, and a good percentage of the people were the same throughout the years. And what I see uh, recently in baseball is that that seems to really have changed. My anecdotal experience is that, and I, I, I would imagine it's true, is that, that people are staying with teams and signing shorter contracts and people getting traded and turned over uh, at a much faster rate. And I have trouble even keeping up with everybody uh, that we've uh, gotten rid of uh, you know, during the, the pennant season as we sink lower and lower in the standings. And, and uh, my question to you is, do you think this is a, is a trend? Do you think it's a problem? especially for kids growing up who, who try to identify with specific people and with a, have a special bond with the, the people on their team, and how do you see it changing or not changing in the future? Well, um, again, having uh, been characterized as a romantic, um, there are some things about the earlier time that you can uh, pine about. Um, but also, you and I know that free agency is here to stay, that is simply not going to change. Uh, there is no, no likelihood that baseball will return to any kind of system that would keep a team like that together. And indeed, football now is going to follow suit with major free agency. So I think it's just a reality of life. Uh, we can all look back with some nostalgia, but we ought not to spend any time uh, sitting around bemoaning current state. It's just not going to change. We plan to go to uh, 815. It's about Four minutes after now, so you're up. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. We had. Th I'm sorry. We'll have to go up here if we're going to keep the rotation. Nobody's there. They're Great. Tired. You're up. My name is Steve Rab. I go to the business school. I'm curious. Um, regardless of how the law deals with him, I'm curious how you think baseball should deal with Vince Coleman. Well, again, um, I, I don't know enough, and uh, I think it, it it's an unfortunate. Um, situation. I think the law has to go first and uh, baseball has to stand back and see what happens. But, uh, you know, that's the sort of behavior that really causes major problems for any sport. I don't think there's any excuse. And uh, I, I think the legal system will take care of it in part, but baseball will have to address it. Uh, again, I, what would I do? I don't know. I, I think baseball will have to deal with it. You know, one, one of the things that gives me a chance to say this, baseball is not different from other businesses or cultures. And people say, well, why doesn't baseball discipline uh, a ball player who, who has an accident uh, drinking or does something untoward? I mean, there are laws and there are systems in place to deal with those people in society. What would Harvard do with an employee who uh, got caught uh, drinking? Probably put him in a counseling program, which is what baseball would do. I think it's very tempting to see baseball as immune from or above or better than the rest of American society or business. And again, that's romantic and not realistic. There are limits on what baseball can do, as there are limits on what Harvard or any other employer can do. Hello, my name is Pete Denon. I work for the firm that audits Harvard. And I'm wondering if you were offered the job if you would take it again as commissioner. Well, not, not, certainly not now. <laughs> I, I think I did the right thing at the time um, for reasons I suggested earlier. I came to baseball with Bart. Uh, we were a partnership. We had a lot of fun uh, when he died. Uh, I mean, it seemed to me the right thing to stay the course and see if I could finish some of what he did, what he wanted to do. And I think I did the right thing. I think. Uh, you know, you know, inevitably, as someone said, a uh, week after you become commissioner, you've got eight owners against you. And the number increases, it never diminishes. 
So you know you're heading into uh, trouble. The minute you make a decision, uh, you got people upset. And uh, on the other hand, you have to, at least I think, you ought to do the job. If you sat there and sort of sucked your thumb all day and said, I'm not going to make any decisions and I'll be popular that way, big secret is you won't. I mean, the people will be upset because you're not doing anything. I, I think the only way to do the job is to do it to the best of your ability. You take the, the, the hits where they come. Yes, I would do it again in 1989. Uh, I'm glad I did it. But uh, it's not a job without its main um, pitfalls. Hi, my name is John Wonderly. I'm a student at the law school. And as I was struggling through the rigors of my third year uh, sports and the law seminar this afternoon, uh, we were discussing the relationship between uh, the players and the owners uh, within the framework of antitrust and uh, labor law. And we were remarking that um, in baseball, comparing baseball to football, baseball the owners are immune for, from antitrust, and football they're not. And yet uh, the baseball players seem to, to uh, our perception was that they seem to be doing better as uh, versus the, the owners, when you would think that the owners in baseball legally would have a stronger position. Um, first, do you think that the baseball players are doing better vis-a-vis -vis the owners in their, their bargaining than football, and what would account for that? Well, it's a little bit like saying the Republicans are richer, why don't they win all the time? Uh, people make a difference. Uh, in, if you look at the history of the sports, the the leadership of the baseball union was brilliant. I, I'm not a great fan of Marvin Miller across the board, largely because of some very ridiculous shots he took at Bart. But no one can gainsay his leadership of that union from the 70 on, 70s on. The football players union, sad to say, probably was nowhere near as well led. Similarly, the ownership in baseball at every turn chose the wrong turn and uh, made things remarkably easy. It, a combination of, of very strong leadership on the part of the players and not such brilliant work on the part of baseball owners. Football, probably somewhat the reverse. People make a big difference in, in every institution, in every, uh, in every uh, community. And uh, I think trying to generalize about the sports without taking into account the uh, ability and, and genius of some of the people along the way is a bad mistake, even for the Harvard Law School. <laughs> um, hi, uh, Mr. Vincent. I'm, my name is Daniel Lipstein, and I'm a senior in the college. And I have this running argument with my father. My father says that even though he's watched much more baseball than me, that the quality of the play now is better because the athletes are bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. And yet, I read like, uh, article that Roger Angel wrote back in the spring in the New Yorker saying he talked to a lot of coaches and the quality seems like the fundamentals have diminished and I look at some of the pitching which has been like totally abysmal this year and I wonder like if you could comment and what do you, you think the caliber of, of play over the last three or four decades has changed for better or for worse? Well, I, again, I think the answer is probably somewhat more complicated. I think there are athletes today doing things in baseball that probably are uh, virtually unparalleled. Some of the talent um, is uh, extraordinary. You have to remember that, among other things, baseball didn't have blacks playing until 1947. So a huge part of the best ball players in the country were playing in the Negro Leagues, where they had great success and great talent. And nobody who was watching baseball, uh, least of all in, in my generation, knew anything about those Negro Leagues. They were never on television. Uh, when I grew up in the 40s and 50s, uh, that those leagues were dying out. But if you talk to the old ball players who played in those leagues, some of those ball players were absolutely remarkable. So you have a whole segment of the population that just didn't play in the old days in the major leagues. I think that makes a significant difference. I think that artificial turf has changed the game enormously, especially in the National League where it's so prevalent. And I think the statistics are probably out of whack. You know, we, we love to say you can compare statistics in baseball because the bat, the ball, and the glove are essentially the same, the same distance, same uh, pitcher's mound and the like. But artificial turf is just simply different. Um, I guess I would say there are probably players playing today who are every bit as good. And, and, and for the reasons your father suggests, probably somewhat better. I think the numbers 
are probably uh, not as great. In the old days, with a smaller number of, of teams and the, and the competition, I remember when the Yankees had a minor league team in, in Newark that was probably every bit as good as most of the American League major league teams. Uh, I mean, they had guys down there that they kept under lock and key, and uh, you know, they were extraordinary talent. You know, they, they had to trade Joe Gordon because they didn't have any room at second base. He'd probably be a Hall of Famer in the future. Uh, I mean, think of it, they had, in the, in the height of the Yankees' power, they had three all-star catchers. They had Barra, they had Howard, and they had Johnny Blanchard. Uh, think of the pitching. I mean, the Yankees in those era, they had Rashi, Reynolds, Lopat, and Ford. I mean, four incredible starters. Uh, no team uh, could do better than that. And I don't think anybody's hit the ball better than Ted Williams. Uh, we know he hit 4-6, and, and there were night games even then. So I think there were some terrific talents in the old days. I think baseball still very well played, but I think expansion has certainly made more players in the major leagues that would be in the minor leagues. Williams makes that argument. You see, you know, if I were playing today, half the pitchers I'd be hitting against would be minor league pitchers. And uh, I don't know, he probably thinks he'd hit 800. <laughs> you know, he's still annoyed. I, I see him, I talk to him. He can tell you the pitch he hit and how stupid he was to hit it when he hit it. He doesn't talk too much about the ones he hit that are great, but he's still annoyed that <laughs> Allie Reynolds got him to pop up twice on two, two consecutive pitches in the second no-hitter. Yogi dropped the first one, and he caught the second one. And Williams will tell you, grabs my cane, and he shows me where the pitch was, up here. He says, I hit it. He says, I can't believe I did it. Stupid. He said, it's, throw me the same pitch. And he said, I hit it. Commissioner, really stupid. <laughs> and he said, and that little guy caught it the second time. He can't believe I did it. I mean, he's, he's, and I, I went to Cooperstown, and there, you know, these guys are in their 70s. And one night I looked up, and there was Johnny Mize showing how he hit an inside pitch to left field to Ralph Kiner. So afterwards, I said, what are you guys doing? You're getting ready to play in the great ballpark in the sky? Because I don't think you're going to get too many inside pitches in your mid-70s. <laughs> uh, he wanted, I mean, Kiner never knew how Mize did. Mize was a great hitter and had a wonderful swing. And he could hit the ball anywhere. And he was explaining to Kiner how he put his elbow down and, and swung. And uh, Kiner was in rapture. So later, Garagiola was there. Garagiola said, you know, he said, these guys are terrific. He said, uh, Musial once, some young guy said to him, Stan, how do you hit the ball to the left field when it's inside? Musial said, oh, he said, it's terrific. He said, I know how to do that. And he said, watch. He go up to the plate. And he said, throw them all inside. So the guy threw him inside. He hit all these line drives to left field. He said, that's just how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jay Dial. I'm a doctoral candidate in the business school. The honor that baseball has reserved for its greatest on-field performers is induction to the Hall of Fame. And that's traditionally been the sole purview of the Baseball Writers Association of America to decide who does and who doesn't get into the Hall of Fame. Uh, a couple of years ago, the owners committee uh, in an apparent uh, uh, attempt to keep Pete Rose out of the Hall of Fame, uh, usurped the Baseball Writers Association's uh, ability to decide. They said that Rose would not, they wouldn't even be allowed to vote on Pete Rose. Could you comment on that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, as uh, I asked Joe DiMaggio one time why he didn't talk to David Halberstam for the book 1949, remember that? He said, I didn't have to talk to him, I was there. <laughs> The big advantage I over, have over you is I was there when that was done. Uh, it was not an owner's committee. The Hall of Fame is administered by a board. It's a board comprised of retired players, executives, uh, business people. Mrs. Yawkey was on the board and the like. The, owners the uh, Hall of Fame had an interesting problem that I didn't know about. I was on the board. But unbeknownst to me, the Hall of Fame had decided that Joe Jackson could not be a candidate for the Hall of Fame through the Old Timers Committee. You know there's an Old Timers Committee that elects. So they had told the Old Timers Committee, you can elect anybody you want except people who are banned from baseball for corruption. So that took Joe Jackson off the list of those to be admitted to the Hall of Fame by the Old Timers. Now here comes Pete Rose. So the Hall of Fame has a rule that says you can't be admitted 
if you are banished from baseball by the old, you can't be admitted by the old timers committee, what do you do with Pete Rose? And I tell you this just as an absolute fact, Stack, Ed Stack, who runs the Hall of Fame <clears throat> and the board of the Hall of Fame, not owners, a board of people who administer the Hall of Fame decided that they had to make those two things comparable. It would be anomalous, if not absurd, to permit the, the writers to elect Pete Rose when their view was Joe Jackson shouldn't be admitted. They did that. They changed the criteria for the Hall of Fame. That's fine with me. I have nothing to do with that as a, as a commissioner. I was a member. I didn't vote. I didn't even go to the meeting because I knew that if I did participate, people would say I was doing something because of Bart or because of Pete Rose. The Hall of Fame has every right, in my judgment, to, to set the criteria for the Hall of Fame. The writers then elect on the basis of that criteria. After all, the Hall of Fame has criteria that say character and integrity are relevant. Writers may say, but we don't like that. We think those things are irrelevant. Well, if you really object and you don't want to participate because you think the criteria are wrong, you have two obligations. Get the criteria changed or don't participate. But if you're going to elect, it seems to me you have a duty to elect on the basis of the criteria that the Hall of Fame administers. It would have been much better, frankly, if the Hall of Fame 20 years ago had just adopted a rule that would have taken care of, P of uh, Joe Jackson and Pete Rose and any other issue that, that would come up. But unfortunately, there was this gap. It had to be addressed, or at least they thought it had to be addressed, and it was. And from my point of view as commissioner, it really didn't affect me. The election to the Hall of Fame is entirely separate from the decision whether to readmit Pete Rose to baseball. And I think on that one, Bart and I uh, were very clear. Pete Rose bet on baseball. He bet on baseball uh, as a player. He bet on baseball as a manager. Uh, he's never admitted it. And I don't think there is a case to be made for readmitting him to baseball because he was a great player, unless you want to say a third base coach or a 200 hitter who cheats and, and bets on baseball should never be readmitted, but anybody who hits 343 and is a, is, is a major figure is to be reinstated. I think the only thing that really can destroy baseball is corruption. And gambling is a major threat to baseball. Uh, but baseball people don't gamble on baseball because they know what will happen. I had a national writer, a big baseball writer, said to me, don't ever feel bad about Pete Rose. He said, I was with him when he bet on baseball in Philadelphia when he was with the Phillies. And I said to him, Pete, what are you doing? If you get caught, you're finished. They'll, they'll destroy you. And he said, oh, no, not me. Well, Pete Rose thought he was bigger than baseball. He told me that. His lawyer said, he's the treasure. You can't go after him. Bart says, watch me. <laughs> he said, he got it all wrong. Baseball is the treasure. Pete Rose isn't the treasure. Bart was right. Sir, you have the last question. My name is John Welch. I'm a neighbor of the school. You mentioned that some of the charms of baseball, or one of the charms, was that it was played without a clock. Uh, after having sat through games going three and a half to four hours, I'm wondering if this is a charm. Well, it's not always a charm. <laughs> That's a great thing about baseball. When you go, you don't know which you're going to get. That's uh, true. You may get one of the memorable short games. You may get a memorable long. The best baseball game I ever saw was the longest. It was the Houston Astro game in 86 in the playoffs that went 15 or 16 innings. It went on half the evening. It was remarkable. And length and time and, and innings had nothing to do with it. On the other hand, like you, I've sat through some miserable no, the, uh, games. The Sox are doing something about it next year. They're starting at 7 o'clock to get us home earlier. But yeah. will there be other attempts more serious to speed things up? A little well, bit? you know, if uh, yes. And I tried to make some. Um, some of them are reasonably easy. You could really get the managers to agree not to go out and dilly-dally around. I mean, the managers will tell you, when they leave the dugout, they know they're going to change the pitcher. So why doesn't the pitcher, the relief pitcher, start in when they leave the dugout? And they say, oh, that'll be fine with me, as long as the other guy does it. But they don't, you know, if, if someone's out there getting a few extra pitches in the, uh, in the bullpen, the, the managers say, well, as long as it's even. Secondly, the strike zone. If you force the umpires to call a strike above the waist, 
you will speed up the game. The game was never intended to be played with strikes only from the belt down. But if you watch, the rare strike is one called above the belt. And the umpires tell you that's because you can get away calling a low strike. If you call a high one, everybody squawks. And they, they can see a high strike better from the dugout. So over the years, the umpires have shrunken the strike zone. And that makes baseball a harder game. It's so much harder to pitch with half a strike zone. Lots can be done, and probably should be, but somebody's got to do it. And uh, they're a little short at the moment. <laughs> This, um, this has been an extraordinary evening. We uh, thank the Harvard Baseball Club for its co-sponsorship and its presence here tonight um, and its baseball. And we thank the eighth commissioner of baseball. We enjoyed the stories and we appreciated the policy as uh, Kennedy School people. Once again, thank Faye Vincent for sharing a really extraordinary evening with us.